Okay, so here's what we were talking about last time. Uh, we were talking about uh, trying to basically rip off the idea that made the fundamental theorem of calculus work and uh, get new theorems just by applying those same ideas in other contexts. We've already been successful with this with the fundamental theorem of line integrals. We're like, hey, instead of a one-dimensional domain on a one-dimensional world, namely the x-axis, right? How about we have a one-dimensional domain in a two- or three-dimensional world, namely a curve in either the plane or in space? Okay. So now, the, what we're doing now is this much more uh, sort of outrageous extension where we're going to consider not just a one-dimensional domain in different contexts, but a two-dimensional domain which is a fundamentally different thing, right? So, so again, the, the big idea is, but let's just remember, we were, you know, when we were looking at these previous two theorems, fundamental theorem of calculus, fundamental theorem of line integrals, we were looking at an accumulating quantity, something that accumulates on the boundary, right, well, correction, something that's computed on the boundary, but that we can view as actually accumulating over the interior, right? So change has this feature. If you're looking at, you know, uh, a curve, let's say, starting there and that goes around like so, the change in the value of some function as I move along that curve, well, grand total, I computed on the boundary, right? It's f of b minus f of a. Right? But it actually is accumulating over the interior in the sense that the change is the sum of little changes that I can sort of keep track of as I move along the curve. Okay, so we have that concept. So can I do that with a two-dimensional domain? Well, two-dimensional domain, I'm going quickly through this, I know, because we did this uh, last time. Two-dimensional domain, like uh, like this thing here, right? Well, it has a one-dimensional boundary curve. We talked about the orientation rules last time. So what is it that uh, is, is computed on the boundary curve now instead of points? What's, what can I say that's computed on the boundary but that actually can be thought of as accumulating over the interior. And, and what I alleged would have this feature, something computed on the boundary, but that accumulates over the interior, is um, a vector line integral. It's clearly computed on the boundary. You give me some vector field, I would compute this vector line integral by going around the boundary, doing the line integral. Right? It's a curve. That's what you do with line integrals. Okay. Um, the remaining question, though, is does this accumulate over the interior and with this is where we uh, where we ended last time so uh, we were considering this scenario where I have uh, let's see here let's do this again uh, we have um, this region here D is the union of well there's the region on the left D1 and the region on the right D2, right, so the yellow, the, the whole thing is the union of the green and the blue, um, is boundary circulation, remember that word circulation, that just means line integral around the boundary, is boundary circulation an accumulating quantity? Is it true that the boundary circulation, uh, whoops, uh, the boundary circulation on uh, this piece uh, plus the boundary circulation on this piece. Do those add up to the boundary circulation around the whole thing? Okay, so let's uh, let's take this uh, slow to one step at a time here. Let's see around uh, the boundary of D one. See, we have that in purple. That purple curve. Well, we're talking about going along C3 and then along what I've called C1 here, you add up the C1 and the C3 line integrals and that gives you the around the boundary of D1. Um, actually, don't leave that circled. Uh, now, what about boundary of D2? Okay, boundary of D2, we've got that, again, circled in red here. Uh, that's going around C2 
And then it's doing this C3 curve, but it's going backwards along C3. And because we're going backwards along C3, uh, let me do this in orange, because we're going <coughs> the wrong direction along the curve C3, we get this minus sign there. Yeah. Okay, so uh, go back up to the picture. The, the the question is, you know, if I look at the red line integral and the purple line integral, do those add up to, well, you know, around the boundary of the whole thing? Well, see, what is the boundary of the whole thing? The boundary of the whole thing would be going around like this. Right? That's around the boundary of the whole thing. That's C1 plus C2, like that. Right. So, so our original question about you know do, the, the, this allegedly accumulating quantity boundary circulation, does it accumulate? Uh, the question uh, turns into you know is purple plus red equal to blue? And well, let's see here. Is purple plus red is it is that equal to blue? Well, because of the cancellation that we get on these two pieces, um, yes it is. Right, look at the purple plus the red. These these terms down here, the one circled in orange cancel, and you just have integral of C1 plus, uh, excuse me, integral over C1 plus integral over C2, both sides of the equation. So yes indeed, this plus this is equal to that. So um, a little bit weird, but Boundary circulation accumulates. Right? So things are starting to fall into place. Now let's go, let me just remind you, what are we doing here? We're trying to rip off what happened with the fundamental thermal calculus, what happened with the fundamental thermal line <coughs> integrals. Um, we wanted to identify, uh, you know, given the context of a domain and its boundary, we want to identify some quantity computed on the boundary that was changed in the fundamental theorems, but that I can view as accumulating over the interior. Right, as results from the integrals that we see in those fundamental theorems. So, computer on the boundary, accumulating over the interior. This line integral does it. This line integral <coughs> is computed on the boundary, but it actually accumulates over the interior, as, as we've just seen. So, by the way, you can, um, you can uh, take this to um, uh, a greater ex extent. Uh, let's look at our, our region here. Suppose our region is... I'm not going to try to fill in that whole thing. It's it would take me a bunch of time, right? But that region right there that I have uh, highlighted in yellow, I can talk about the boundary circulation uh, around this. And I ask, does that is that boundary circulation the sum of the boundary circulations around all of the little bitty itty teensy weensy little pieces that I get when I you know dice up this uh, this region into a bunch of little pieces? Uh, is that purple line integral uh, equal to the sum of well? Let's see. I need the uh, I need the boundary circulation <coughs> around that piece plus the boundary circulation around that piece plus the boundary circulation around that piece, plus the boundary circulation around that blah, 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 right? All these pieces together and check it out what happens. And I guess I'll zoom in so we can uh, see better what's going on here. Um, we look at boundary circulations around these individual pieces. Uh, we're going to have line integrals that look like that. And then here's another. Remember the rule, always go I'm going to sloppily say counterclockwise. In this case, that's fine. Right? Always counterclockwise. And when you add up all of these little purple circulations, there's just lots and lots of cancellations that happen. Um, on this edge here, on that edge, on one side, I'm going one direction. On the other side, I'm going the other direction. I'm doing this edge twice, but with <laughs> opposite orientations. Those have exact negative values of each other, and therefore they add up to zero. They cancel. Um, okay. Uh, what about... Uh, yeah. 
What about uh, on this edge? Well, same deal. Um, keep going, and I think I can persuade you that this happens on all of what you might want to call the interior edges, right? I mean, if you're going to get this same kind of cancellation on these horizontal edges. Again, you're going the same, going on the same little piece of curve twice, opposite orientations, therefore opposite values adding to each other and canceling. Okay. All right. So looking back at the bigger picture, then, uh, even though these little <laughs> these little purple circulations here, all of the I mean, there's a lot of them. We're computing line integrals over a bunch of. Uh, segments that are simply not part of the original line integral that we're interested in at all, and yet they all cancel. They all disappear in a puff of smoke. Um, the only edges for on which there are line integrals that don't cancel ah, here we go, uh, are uh, the ones that are part of the original boundary. So, for example, look at uh, look at one of these edges over here. Let's look at that that region there. Um, going counterclockwise. Right, you get that. Well, um, that edge there cancels because there's another piece or on the other side of it that where it's going the other way and it cancels. Uh, this piece cancels, that piece cancels, and what doesn't cancel <coughs> is that one. There is nothing else over on the other side to cancel with. Right? Okay, so when you add up, uh, the, I mean, it's, it's weird that it just works out so beautifully like this. When you add up all of these little circulations, you know, that circulation plus that circulation plus that circulation, add all these up. Don't forget the little, the little odd-shaped things on the ends. When you add them up, grand total of the circulation you get is just, well, around uh, what was, in fact, the original boundary curve. So no matter how many pieces you have, boundary circulation accumulates. And uh, we'll write that down uh, like this. Uh, the circulation around the boundary of the whole thing uh, is the sum of the boundary circulations around the individual little pieces. Okay. Everybody happy with that? Okay. Uh, now, uh, remember when we were our, our our goal here is to again sort of steal all of the ideas that worked so nicely for us with the fundamental theorems. So, what was the next thing that we did after we made the observation of accumulation? The very next thing we did is we said, "Hey, we're taking a limit of something that doesn't change, and so that limit is equal to that value that this thing is that never changes." In other words, you can take a limit for free, right? So, okay. All right. Uh, again, what is our kind of our sort of big picture goal here? Our big picture goal is to turn something that's computed on the boundary into uh, a, an accumulation, you know, a summation over the interior. So our, we speculate this is going to turn into a double integral. And notice it's kind of getting there, right? This looks a lot like a double integral. We are adding up stuff over all of the pieces making up the interior of this solid region, right? It's almost exactly like a double integral. There's just this one little structural thing missing, and that is, uh, well, there's no, uh, there's no da at the end, right? So, um, can I, can I somehow or another get a delta a over there? Obviously, I'd have to divide by delta a here, right? Now it looks like a double integral. Um, but then there's this question of, okay, well then, but what, what did I just create? What is this thing here? Boundary circulation divided by area. Oh, and by the way, in the limit, as I slice finer and finer, what is it that this, you know, what, what's going to be my integrand, what does that turn into? Is that even a thing? <coughs> right. Now, when we got to this stage with the fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, we just looked at it and recognized it. We said, oh, check it out. It's delta y over delta x. Sweet, that's going to turn into the derivative. I already know what that is, and I've got millions of rules for it. So it's easy, easy to calculate, and we we're very happy to just recognize. We got super lucky there. Um, well, we don't get that lucky here. Right? And yet, 
there's nothing that requires that we get lucky in order to be able to have a theorem, right? We don't have to have the answer that we're that we're uh, that we're heading towards be something we've already seen. There's no need for that. It's nice when it happens, but it's not necessary. So um, <laughs> this is not something we previously recognized. Oh well. It is, however, something that we can compute. And uh, this is where I'm going to um, uh, sweep some details under the rug. Uh, this is a, a calculation that, uh, you know, it's a little tedious. It's not that bad, but um, this in the limit um, is uh, something that can be computed. I'm just going to assert what it is. For Math 212, I think this is very appropriate. Um, and uh, here's... Uh, Here's what it is. By the way, in order for this to be true, there's a regularity condition. We do need the, the vector field to be continuously differentiable. Not our problem in Math 212. We're going to sort of assume that that's always there. <laughs> um, so this new integrand thing, that thing, you know, in the limit as I slice finer and finer, <coughs> can be computed with that formula. Which, at this point now, you do recognize, because the book made this... I think kind of weird choice to just write down this formula a couple of weeks ago and tell you, hey, this is something that uh, means something to your great confusion, right? What? No indication of why or what uh, this would possibly mean at the time that this came up in section 15.1. Now we have a context for it. This thing, this greens operator, as I, you may recall, I like to call this thing. This greens operator is the integrand in the, the new theorem. But more to the point, you can look at this formula from where it came from, um, and you can see exactly what it is. It's circulation <laughs> per unit area. It's a density. Right now, I, I remind you, if, let's go back to the, um, the fun little thermic calculus, you know, way back here in our, um, when we were looking at fun little thermic calculus, and we had, uh, let's see, let me throw an integral sign in front of both of these. Um, so uh, change, so uh, f of b minus f of a is, you know, integral f prime dx. This was, this is our fundamental thermic calculus <laughs> that this is all modeled on. And notice that uh, this accumulating quantity computed on the boundary, but accumulating over the interior, is an integral of this thing, which I interpret as a density, because the integral of it gives me an accumulating quantity. That's what densities are, right? Is accumulating quantity per unit size. That's density. So I floated this idea that seemed weird at the time that, uh, you know, hey, I know you've got a bunch of points of view already on F prime, and you want to think about derivatives of slopes and, you know, uh, factors and rates of change, what have you. But let's t add to our list, new way to think about the derivative, it's change density. Weird. Right? Change density. Because it, because it is... Uh, change, you know, looking at a curve, it is the amount of change per unit size of the piece of the domain that you're looking at. It is change per unit size. Accumulating quantity per unit size. Well, now we have a new accumulating quantity. We're looking at vector line integrals. Our vector line integrals, um, boundary circulations, right? Um, are accumulating and accumulating quantity per unit size is a density. So this is how I'd like for y'all to think about Green's operator. Um, uh, so uh, this thing here uh, that I call Green's operator, yeah, it's the integrand and the theorem <laughs> that we're about to write down, and that's fine. And yeah, it's this formula that they made us memorize back in section 15.1. Okay, sure. Um, I like to think of this as circulation density, circulation per unit area. Okay, all right. So, time for that. Uh, oops, there we go. All right, so uh, let's put it all together. Here's our result then. Um, uh, result slash summary. Circulation accumulates. Throw in a limit for free. Um, Multiply and divide by canceling 
Delta A's, that's free. Uh, oh, come on, pencil. Uh, recognize that we have a double integral. Ask very reasonably, you know, in this limit, what does that thing turn into? Uh, our, uh, our claimed assertion here is that it's dq dx minus dp dy, and altogether, here's our new theorem. This is, it's kind of like the fundamental theorem of calculus as applies to a two-dimensional region living inside of R2. Um, and it's called Green's theorem. Okay, so there's different ways to write this down, by the way. Uh, very first time I saw Green's theorem, it was written differently. Uh, it was written instead uh, like this. <laughs> And there is that notation again. That again, you know, I'm just I'm just not a fan. Uh, in this context, in Math 212, I don't think that that's uh, a good choice. Uh, of no, all that means, though, of course, is it means uh, line integral. Right, it's just the vector line integral. Anyway, so so this is a, a uh, uh, arguably more common way to see Green's theorem. So heads up. Um, here's the way. Uh, that uh, now that we have all this set up, the way I would like to write Green's theorem, I think this is arguably the most compact way to do it. And let me zoom for visibility purposes. Um, what I like about this is you can see that it, that these two domains relate in that the boundary of that one is that one. Right, we're looking at a region and its boundary. Um, and you can furthermore see in this notation that this integrand relates to that integrand by way of an explicit operation, Green's operator. Yeah. Okay, plus it's very compact on the page, and I just, that's appealing. Um, don't forget, of course, what all of this represents. The thing on the left is boundary circulation, and then as such, the integrand is circulation density. Okay, all right. Okay, so let's uh, let's see some examples. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, there's a there's a conceptual way to think about Green's theorem. I think it's very important. There's applications of that. We'll talk about that later on. Um, but uh, as y'all will recall, the fundamental theorem of calculus, even though we developed it from this point of view of hey, it's a way of computing change, that's not really the bi the big use of the fundamental theorem of calculus is to compute integrals with change. You know, f of b minus f of a is usually the answer, not the question, right? Um, so uh, uh, anyway, along those lines, I mean, very often, you know, what we do with um, uh, with Green's theorem is we just use it to compute stuff. Now, it does tend to get used to compute stuff the other way. And let me uh, flip over, by the way. Oh, I, you know, I should have – here, let me let me, let me me uh, interrupt myself and spend a moment talking back about this diagram. We Remember, we talked about this diagram last time. Um, and we set these things up, and at the time that we said, hey, let's stick these operators into each other like this, that seemed like an arbitrary uh, thing to do. Um, and you can see a little bit more context for that here. Um, remember, the point of view that we took on the fundamental thermal line integrals was that if you take a curve and look at its boundary, <coughs> if you take a function and compute its gradient, then that evaluation, namely f of b minus f of a, is equal to this evaluation, namely the line integral. Okay, so let me just point out that we now have the exact same pattern for Green's theorem. I mean, just notice that it, it we, I mean, by construction, right? We, it's not an accident. We did this on purpose. But if you take a two-dimensional region, look at its boundary, and take a vector line integral over that boundary, uh, then that's the same as applying Green's operator to the vector field and doing a double <coughs> integral um, of that resulting function. Same pattern. Okay. Uh, yeah? Um, what does that notation on the integral represent um, in the, to the Green's theorem on the map? Like the little integral symbol with the circle? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, great question. Uh, let me talk about that. Um, that is, uh, it's not really necessary um, this, so he's asking about that symbol right there. What does that mean and why didn't I use it uh, there? You may be wondering, yeah. Uh, so that little circle is just, a, it's kind of a visual reminder to the reader that this is not just any old random line integral. This is a line integral around a boundary of something. So it's a closed line integral. That's all. If you don't put that little circle on there, it's fine. Honestly, I rarely put that little circle on there. 
Uh, it's like I say, it's just a kind of a visual reminder. It's not not required. Good question. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, let's see here. Where? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's okay. Let's go back over to uh, here. So let's uh, com- let's compute some. Right. Oh yeah, and now the re- reason I came back over to this page in the first place, the the way we use the fundamental theorem of, of uh, line integrals usually is there's a line integral I want to compute. That's what I want to know, and I interpret it with the fundamental theorem as okay. I'm going to instead compute a difference. So we tend to use the fundamental theorem of line integrals going to the left, you might say. Right. Very often, not always, very often, though, the way we use Green's theorem is the opposite. Again, there are exceptions, but sometimes, often, we want to compute a line integral. <laughs> and uh, it ends up being handy to rewrite the line integral that we're interested in as a double integral that sometimes is just easier to compute. This is how it works very often. All right, so that's uh, that's an asymmetry, and I just wanted to point that out before we uh, go on. So here we're going to apply that idea, and um, yeah, so we're computing this line integral here. Uh, we've got a curve. That's the counterclockwise oriented boundary of the unit. Yes, that's our curve for our line integral. Um, we have a vector field. That's a given there. So we've got a curve and a vector field to compute the line integral. By the way, you, I mean, you can just parameterize. You can 15-2 this problem. right? Parameterize the curve, plug it in there, and get going. I'm not saying I want to do that, but I'm saying you could do that. right? And by the way, let's think through why that would be annoying to do. If you parameterize, here's our curve. right? How are you going to parameterize that boundary curve um, of, our, of our unit disk? Well, sines and cosines. Okay, that means that in your parameterization, x and y are sines and cosines. So you're going to have e to the power of cosine x in your integral. You're going to have arctan of sine, or uh, t, I guess, arctan of sine t, which, you know, you can simplify with trig. But anyway, it, that's going to be clunky, at least. Right. Yeah. Who would parameterize it? Would the yeah. be from zero to two pi? Yep, because we're going all the way around the circle. That's right. Zero to two pi. Yep. Anybody else? Feel free. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's not. Right. Let's let's see if we can outsmart this problem. Uh, Green's theorem is going to be our tool for doing this. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, wait a second. Now, can I use Green's theorem? Let me go back to my diagram here. Here's Green's theorem. Green's theorem does involve a line integral. True. However, very importantly, Green's theorem comes with an asterisk. All of these uh, theorems that we're going to talk about in Chapter 15 have little asterisks. Um, this one says uh, you can't just compute any line integral. You can only compute line integral around a boundary curve. You can see it right there, right? That It says right there... <laughs> Not just any line integral. This Green's theorem only relates to line integrals around curves that are boundaries. And I want to emphasize this is not some, you know, huffy, you know, pure mathematician formality. That's a really big deal. It has to be a boundary. Here's how a big a deal it is. <coughs> it has to be a boundary because we have to know that thing that it's the boundary of because that thing is the domain for the double integral we're going to turn it into. Right, so it's not just this technicality of oh, it only works if it's a boundary. It's that the formula doesn't make any sense at all, even interpreted sloppily, doesn't make any sense at all unless your curve is a boundary of something. Everybody on board with that? Okay, so going back to the question here, we have this issue. Sure, we were given um, uh, some curve. Is that a boundary? Well, thankfully, in this case, yes, it is. Um, in fact, it was even stated as being a boundary. Right, this curve is the boundary, and what is it the boundary of? It's the boundary of uh, that disk. By the way, it's even oriented correctly, right? Okay, yeah? Um, if F was the gradient, 
Uh, no, that's a great question. Let, let me. I'm going to come back to that. Now, you're, you're getting ahead of me. That's a fantastic question. I am going to come back and talk. But let me. Uh, I want to. I want to delay on that. Yeah, I have my reasons. Um, okay, so um, yeah, because we have a boundary, um, because this curve is the boundary of that disk, right? It's the boundary of this disk. Green's theorem says that I can rewrite the boundary line integral, the boundary circulation, in fact, right? Let's not forget what this is. We're measuring circulation of this vector field. Uh, we can rewrite that as a double integral of Green's operator, dq dx minus dp dy. Uh, this, uh, Green's operator is pretty straightforward to compute in this case. I need to take the x partial of that. That's easy, right? Then I need to subtract the y partial of that. That's easy as it happens with this example, the ugliest terms <laughs> in the vector field go away in the computation of Green's operator. Now, you won't always get that lucky. I arranged this example to work out awesome because it's my first example, right? So I wanted it to work out just nice, you know, super nice. So not always, but in this case, it works out great. We're, we're now computing, you'll notice, a double integral of, well... You know, over that disk, I'm computing a double integral of 2. And that's a, uh, a thing has region pi, uh, has an area pi, and so this uh, just turns into 2 pi. No sweat. No ugly antiderivatives. Everybody happy? Okay. Okay, so great question from up front here. Uh, uh, what about fundamental theorem of line integrals? How come... And maybe I, maybe I should use fundamental theorem of line integrals. Can I use the fundamental theorem of line integrals? And I claim that no, you can't. In fact, it's already, there is uh, evidence on the page as to why we can't use the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Let's go back to our diagram. By the way, you may have noticed, I like this diagram. Um, I refer to this a lot. It's just so handy. All right, everything's put together exactly where it all fits. It's so organized. Everything's where it ought to be. I want to encourage you all to make use of this diagram. Here's another example. I have a vector field. I would like to know, does it have an anti-gradient? How do I decide that? Well, take Green's operator and see if you get zero. Do you get zero when you take Green's operator of this vector field? Uh, nope. Right, so we all, in some sense, before we even finished the Green's theorem calculation, we knew that we didn't get zero there, and therefore there is no anti gradient, and therefore you can't use the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Everybody on board? Okay, so yeah, well, that's that's awful convenient. Um, okay. All right, here's another example. So uh, a vector field given. Uh, I want to compute a line integral over some curve. The curve is, uh, well, it's this thing drawn below. So it's, this is a weird curve. Uh, it's kind of a sort of a triangular figure eight, if you will. Everybody see what that curve is? It's got four pieces. Uh, suppose you want to compute that line integral. Well, now, again, you have options. Uh, one thing you could consider doing is um, parametrizing. Trouble is, there's four chunks to parametrize. you got to parametrize that, and then completely separately parametrize that, and then three, and then four. So four separate questions. Yikes. Let's let's call that plan B. I don't really want to. If I can avoid setting up four separate integrals, I'd like to avoid it. Okay. Um, okay. Is this curve a boundary of something? Kind of. Right? I don't want to be too careless here, but I mean, look, the curve appears to be the boundary of uh, this pair of triangles. Yeah? So this temptation to say, hey, Green's theorem and just, uh, you know, wave your magic wand and uh, walk away, right? Um, so you got to be a little bit careful with this, though. The orientations matter. Um, so <coughs> now let's look at these triangles one at a time. Uh, this triangle here, yeah, <coughs> boundary 
Remember the word boundary always means around the outside piece anyway, or boundary means counterclockwise. So yeah, the curve that we're looking at on all three chunks, we are going the direction that the word boundary says we should be going. So we literally are going around the boundary of D1. Yeah. However, for this triangle here, boundary, again, that word boundary means counterclockwise around the outside. So that's the boundary of D2. And that's not what we're doing, right? The curve that we've been given goes the opposite direction. So that's bad, right? But sometimes when, you know, so it's not just bad, it's like, it's exact, it's perfectly bad. It's the exact wrong orientation. So what that means is the integral that I'm interested in computing is the exact negative of the integral around the boundary. And so all that means is, yeah, sure, we're talking about, you know, uh, integral D1, boundary of D1, integral boundary of D2, but it's just that um, we're going to subtract the line integral around the boundary of D2. Boundary of D2, here, let me write this a little bit differently. Uh, boundary of D2 is uh, in purple, right? So therefore, the negative of the boundary of D2 is exactly what we want. Everybody happy? I'll be on the lookout for that kind of, you know, bad luck slash good luck. <laughs> right. So anyway, um, uh, nice uh, punchline. Uh, e each of these integrals is a boundary. Each of these integrals, therefore, is subject to Green's theorem. Each of these integrals, vector line integrals, can be computed with a uh, double integral. Green's operator, easy to compute, dq dx minus dp dy. It's 5 minus 4, which is, which is easy. Um, and so you get uh, a couple of area calculations and uh, in yet further good fortune, uh, these two pieces have the same area and so the difference is <coughs> zero. So the answer is zero. Everybody happy? Questions on that one? Okay, All right. okay moving along. Okay, I, um, I'm going to go quickly through this uh, next couple of pages because this is just a, this is a cute little corollary and it's kind of neato, but it's this. It, you know, anyway, it's it's a. It, this is not worth two pages worth of lecture notes, right? So I'm going to go quickly through it. Uh, Green's theorem, nothing new there. That's just Green's theorem. Let's consider what happens though to Green's theorem when we plug in this specific vector field. That's a trick vector field. Very convenient, important vector field. What is, uh, for this vector field, what does Green's theorem look like? Well, dq dx minus dp dy is 1. So I have here a double integral of 1 over a two-dimensional region. And we already know that means we're just adding up little pieces of area. And so the right-hand side of Green's theorem turns into the area of the region. Okay. Um, what about the other side? Uh, whoops the other side uh, of, um, of Green's theorem. Let's use that old notation that I'm not a fan of, right? Because that's how this example works. Um, well, the integral of, uh, you know, PDX plus QDY turns into uh, this, namely that. So altogether, when you're using that special vector field, in the case of that special vector field, you get a corollary of Green's theorem that the area of a two-dimensional region can be computed by a line integral, a special line integral going around the outside boundary, namely just an integral of x dy. So, yeah, yeah anyway, a little corollary. Um, now, you might think to yourself, you know what, uh, pass, I think I'll just compute the area. Right? <laughs> um, that's uh, one of these weird line integrals. Um, but it is, in fact, only a single integral area, if you're going to compute, you know, an area, it's a kind of sort of a double interval. So it's a simplification from that point of view. But even better than that, sometimes this integral here 
is easy to compute. Uh, sometimes it's really easy to compute, and uh, so that makes this this corollary all the more valuable, um, specifically on line segments. Uh, this is a great practice problem. Everyone should do this uh, on your own. Uh, if you have uh, the line segment from some point to some other point, just you know x1 to x2, well, you guys can parameterize a line segment, right? Parameterize that line segment. There's x1, uh, there's x2. Um, if you parameterize that line segment, the integral in question, integral x dy, is computed with simple arithmetic. It's um, the average value of x, whatever the you know the average of the two x coordinates is, average value of x uh, times the change in y. x bar delta y. It'll always be this integral x dy is always x bar delta y. Um, so, like I say, exercise. Parameterize the line segment. Plug your parameterization straight into the integral x dy. Take a deep breath. Plug and chug. It's not that bad. Again, everybody should do this once in their lives. Um, and um, sure enough, just, that's what you get on the right-hand side. Yeah? How would you be able to find like, the domain of that? How would you what now? Because, oh, is this just an example? Yeah, this is just an example. So I'm making the assertion that it, that uh, on a line segment, integral x dy is uh, easy to calculate. Now, you point out correctly, I suspect, is what you were thinking, that this has got to be around a boundary, and line segments can't be boundaries, right? Um, but a collection of line segments can be boundary, and that's what we're going to do. We're basically going to apply the, the, uh, the, the formula that I'm asking you all to prove on your own. We're going to apply that one, two, three, four five times. And so uh, imagine this scenario here. Suppose, you know, somebody gives you a, this wacky, uh, uh, what's that thing called? Polygon, I guess. So, yeah, wacky polygon. I had to think through the lingo. Uh, and uh, no right angles, right? All the edges are weird. All the angles are weird. How do you compute the area of such a thing? Well, uh, maybe not such a bad idea then to compute integral x dy. Namely, add up integral x dy on all five edges, each of which is simple arithmetic, and you're done. So, re really neat trick. Okay. All right, I'm going to let you all read the rest of, the, uh, of that example. Okay, here are some pretty non-trivial ideas. This is, uh, I think, really important. Um, the, the setup of this is uh, delicate, so I want to be careful with how we set this up. So here's our story. Uh, we're going to start with two points. One is going to be our designated starting point. The other is our designated ending point. Um, I would like to then consider a couple of curves that, as they are supposed to, start at the designated starting point, end at the designated ending point, in such a way that they make up then the boundary between them, the boundary of uh, a two-dimensional region. So there's a lot that's going on in this picture. There's a two-dimensional part of this picture, there are some one-dimensional parts of this picture, and there's some zero-dimensional parts of this picture, right? We got uh, area, curves, and points. Right. Okay, so, um, uh, note the way I have this set up. Uh, the um, the boundary of those two curves, right? C1 and C2, they have the same boundary. Well, they have the same starting point and they have the same <laughs> ending point, so they are, therefore they have the same boundary. Yeah, everybody on board? Okay. Um, furthermore, the boundary of the region, the boundary of this yellow region well, that's um, that's the two curves, but we, uh, kind of. I mean, again, you got to be careful about this. It's not just C1 plus C2, because when you're doing boundary, and don't forget, boundary means counterclockwise. Yeah, you're doing doing C1, right? But then you're doing you're doing C2 backwards. <laughs> 
right? So C1 minus C2 really is the boundary of D. And okay, so very, very common reaction for students to have at this point is, oh, okay, well then I, I just, I set this up in an unnatural way. Uh, I should rewrite C2. Uh, here, let me, let me see if I can fix this, right? I'm going to rewrite C2 going this way so that I can turn that into a plus. Now, the boundary of D is C1 plus C2, you know, right and proper, no minus signs. The minus signs are unfortunate, right? Here's the problem. Now, that's not true anymore. And in fact, if you think about it, boundary of C1 and boundary of C2, they're exactly opposites of each other. We're starting where the other one's ending. We're ending where the other one's starting. If they were the same curve, we would say that we're going exact opposite orientations, right? So on the boundaries, they're negatives of each other, <laughs> right? So the way you would fix this is to say boundary of C1 is negative boundary of C2. And so... So changing the orientation of C2, it makes one minus sign go away and it makes another minus sign appear. So here's the, the better way to approach this. Um, the better way to approach this is to accept <laughs> that this minus sign is natural. That's a real thing. That's the way geometry of the plane works. It's the, the way boundaries work. There is a minus sign there, and you can't do anything about it. Okay. All right. Um, now, related to this, uh, there is a, here's another question that comes up. Okay, so students want to say, okay, so the rule then is, you know, always orient the two curves uh the same way, or sometimes students like to say, well, no, you have to orient them the opposite way, because look, see, they're opposite. One's clockwise, one's counterclockwise. Those are opposites, aren't they? No, they're, those are oriented the same way, because look, they both start at the same point, and they both end at the same point, so C1 and C2 have the same orientation. No, they have opposite orientations. No, they have the same orientation. You get this argument going sort of back and forth. It depends on how you're sort of looking at it, right? The right answer is, is that there is no comparison between the orientations on C1 and C2. They're different curves. It's an apples and oranges comparison. You can't say that they're the same or that they're opposite. They're just, they're <coughs> different curves. There's no relationship between them at all. Right, so don't step on that little landmine. You can drive yourself crazy trying to uh, decide if it's is it this way, is it that way. It's neither. Okay. All right. So. Okay. So with this set up, I have 40 seconds in which I'm going to actually accomplish something pretty cool. Um, so check this out. Um, we consider Green's theorem as it applies to this region D. I think I can do this in 40 seconds. Um, here's Green's theorem. Right? Notice that the boundary is C1 minus C2. So all this is here is just Green's theorem as it applies to that region. And now let's consider a little uh, entertaining question. What would happen if Green's operator were equal to zero? Let's just say that we're looking at it hypothetically. I don't know. Pretend we have a vector field where Green's operator is equal to zero. Okay, well, hey, the thing is, if Green's operator is zero, we're doing a double integral of zero, which means that the double integral is zero, but that means that the difference between these line integrals is zero. Where have I heard that before? Two line integrals on paths that start and end at the same point, always the same. That means that your vector field's path independent. That means that your vector field is a gradient. And what we have here is a geometric point of view on why one of the lifetime theorems makes sense. Why is it that Green's operator being zero should tell your vector field is a gradient? Right, that's one of these, one of these lifetime theorems. Green's operator being zero tells you that you have a gradient because of this application of Green's theorem to that picture. And there's a lot to digest there. Uh, I encourage you all to spend a little time thinking about this. I'm going to pick up and uh, talk about this some more on Friday. See you all later. Oh, I do have the exams. Um,